flat, all right? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So, Pres, I'm starting. No, sir. Uh, uh, welcome to all of you, all the distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, the topic is stress management in uncertain times. I don't think anything could be more topical in the current situation. Stress management and uncertain times. Uncertain times always bring stress. Bad times also bring stress, but you know the way out. Uncertain times, you don't know which way the, uh, which way the things are moving. So we have gone through two COVIDs. Now I believe China is going to have another COVID. It has impacted all of us grievously. Deaths, uncertain job losses, health worry. There couldn't be a greater stress than what is what we have uh, what we have gone through. I mean, in the last hundred years, I except the World War Two and one, I don't think there have been a greater stress. Now with China also now re realigning with COVID again, I hope we don't get into a greater stress. Now, stress management in these times is essentially a knowledge which will percolate to all of us and the entire audience. And we got a panel of speakers, diverse panel of speakers, is distinguished speakers who can throw light on the subject and I'm sure this will be extremely beneficial for all of us and all the audience. And uh, we look forward to a scintillating uh, webinar, which uh, we can uh, take a lot of uh, truths home, a lot of learnings home, and we can work on that. Uh, having said that, can I request the president of ICC, Mr. Kapil Kaul, to commence his presentation? Uh, Kapil Kaul needs no introduction, and uh, we we uh, we uh, he's he's a luminary himself and a president of this uh, August organization. I really thank uh, Kapil to that you have got this subject at this time of the at this time of the uh, to work all round, and uh, the process will be after Mr. Call finishes his presentation. I'll be introducing. The next speaker very shortly, so speakers don't mind. Your large and distinguished biodata may get squeezed, but nevertheless, our respect remains for all of you. And of course, the timekeeping, which I will keep reminding. So Kapil, kindly take the floor, or let's say kindly take the virtual floor. Green. Thank you, SD. Uh, good day, good morning, good evening to everybody out here today. Uh, my personal thanks to everybody uh, who has made it uh, possible to come and attend this webinar today. It's very critical and uh, it's uh, very pertinent to the times. And uh, um, however, I, I, would look at, uh, I would look at this uh, topic with a different perspective and a different view. And, and I would like to make it positive. We, we have the option of looking at it in a negative light and or anything for the matter of fact, and anything in a positive light. So I look, I'd like to take this in a positive light, just as much as I have taken uh, the pandemic in its positive light. So I would say that uh, the world was a global village uh, till two years ago. And after the pandemic, and thanks to the virtual technology, it's become a global home. And the future is right now here and now in our bedrooms. It's not outside of our homes, it's right within our homes. And I take it that um, essentially it's a convergence. It's a convergence of technologies. It's a convergence of philosophy, thinking uh, of humanity. We are coming much closer to each other by a global phenomenon, uh, which actually, and I, I, I tend to disagree that, uh, you know, we are, we, a lot of countries are trying to think of going apart. It's not going to work. In fact, it's going to bring us closer because we don't have the global resources as individuals, as families, as companies, or as countries to do it alone. It has to be done united with everybody, just like the solutions and the vaccines have been brought together. together. 
Uh, coming to stress, um, I say it's it's a, a question of three degrees. It's what do you need? What is it you want? Or rather, what is it you want? And what is it that you actually need? And what are your desires? And what is your greed? It's a balance of these four that really creates the stress. So if you balance yourself, it does create stress still, doesn't matter. But the fact remains is that stress can be broken up into three uh, ways, physical stress, mental stress, and spiritual stress. Physical stress, we know you don't, uh, your fat does not become muscle until you stress, you exercise, and you walk, or you run, or whatever you do, pull weights. And when you do, it pains your body, right? But it's temporary pain and you grow, you grow, you grow stronger, you grow bigger, you grow more, you have more stamina, right? So it doesn't come without stress. Same thing with mental, your growth of knowledge, acquisition of knowledge does not come without your reading, 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 and reading till probably your eyes strain or whatever. So that's stress in a different way but then you are acquiring knowledge, right? And then when you have an emergency, that knowledge is what stands by you. Like my, my, my grandmother and my, uh, my father told me at the age of seven, I remember this is one of the first questions that they placed on me and they asked me, they said, who's your best friend? And I said that, uh, I took my best friend's name at that time, he was a Maharashtrian, Guy, Dhananjay Date. We are still friends, of course. This was, we are way back in 1964. And I said that uh, we are, well, it's Dhananjay Date. So my grandmom said, you're wrong. So I got confused. I said, how can I be wrong about who's my best friend? So I said, well, I took another friend's name. I said, Pradeep Sharma. They said, no, you're wrong again. So I said, then it seems you seem to know me better. Why don't you tell me who's my best friend? So my grandmother said, she said, knowledge is your best friend. Books are your best friend, right? When you're in a crisis, when you've got a problem, when you're in stress, at that point of time in an emergency, the only thing that will come to your aid is your knowledge, your, your books that you've read and what you have acquired. So it comes to stress and spiritual, of course, uh, we all make mistakes. We all try and be ethical. But we all do break the law, we do break things, etc. It's a question of ethics. And however we develop. So there's no perfection, there's a balance. So with this, uh, I thank everybody for having come to uh, a session which is very critical. And at the same time, I would also like to point out that I've made a conservation of three E's. If you can see the logo, which is on the top corner out here, which I've made. I have made this logo and given it to the Indo-American Chamber because the environment is what I have made into the theme for the year and going forward. And conservation of the energy, conservation of energy, conservation of ecology, and conservation of the environment is what is very critical and going forward. And if we don't conserve, which we are not, and we are leading a consumerist era, which again is creating stress. Consumerism, the way it is happening is creating waste and that waste is creating stress. So we are definitely in the age where we need to manage our stress in a way that we make stress our builder of ourselves as, a, as physical entities or in any other way, the, the spiritually or mentally. So thank you very much everybody for being here. I give the floor back to you, Mr. Mukherjee. Thank you. Thank you, President Call. That was... Uh... A small but very nice uh, presentation. You talked about positive. I think I think that's very important. We need to look at a positive light. We need to look at a balance. Stress is there, and the balance will have to be achieved. And I think the most important thing you mentioned was the knowledge. The in fact, the spiritual knowledge to combat this. Thank you, uh, President Call. I'm sure we will use these things in future as we go along with the speakers. Uh, I would now request the guest of honor, Gregory Taves, uh, to make his presentation. But prior to that, let me introduce um, uh, 
Mr. Taves. He is a deputy senior commercial officer at the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi. Prior to that, he was in Mumbai. He's had 20 years of experience across the continents, Mexico, Lisbon, Tokyo, Mumbai, and has been helping SME uh, companies in US with trade to meet their trade and investment objectives. Uh, Mr. Taves, thank you for joining us. And uh, the floor is yours, or the virtual floor is yours. I would just make one request, kindly hold to 10 minutes time uh, time span uh, that would be great uh, mr taves it's it's your call thank you Shant shantanu and and also thank you to president cole um hello from the american embassy and i just like to say iic has um iacc has been uh, an incredible partner over the years uh, I think we work well together to um, to help uh, your members and and the companies in, in the United States uh, do more trade and investment. And we look forward to, to more of that in the future. Um, as you know, um, the the commercial part of the embassy is part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, we look for solutions. Um, to Indian issues and problems that American companies can help with, uh, supply chain issues, um, any number of, of problems that, uh, that are here in India that American companies can help with. And we think it's a real win-win situation. We have seven offices around the country. Uh, parts, uh, they're all a part of the consulates and em embassy. Uh, of the United States. Uh, we also uh, promote uh, investment from India to the United States. I'll mention that we have a uh, select USA summit coming up this June, um, June 26th through 29. And it is an in-person event for the first time in three years. Um, so we are, um, accepting applications for that, and we welcome any questions or, or interest in that area. I, I can say that um, sometimes our work in the embassy does get stressful. Uh, we, we have to deal with it uh, all the time. Sometimes are, are more stressful than others. And I can really relate to what President Cole uh, said about this. Um, I'll just, I'll just point out something that uh, at work or at home, uh, the most stressful, uh, the origin of stress uh, comes from thinking about either the past or the future. Uh, concerned about those two, two areas that you really can't control, that's where the stress about um, the moment where you are, you know exactly what to do, and there's very little stress involved. You know how to walk, you know how to eat, you know how to sleep, uh, you know how to breathe, and it's only when your mind starts thinking about the future or the past that you start to get stressed. I think it's also helpful I found to evaluate uh, what it is in your life that is helping you or making you stressed. So if you can identify those things that are actually helping you and giving you less stress, it's good to note, note those and note the things that make you more stressed. Uh, I find that um, when my life and my surroundings are cluttered with things, papers, things, uh, objects, uh, that increases my stress. And maybe that's a very personal thing. But I think if I, if I have an orderly uh, desk or surroundings, I'm less stressed. 
Um, I think it's important to create boundaries. Uh, so to leave your work uh, and your email on your phone at a certain time of day, and you can kind of leave that behind and focus on something else and make sure uh, that you have some routines that help you out. Uh, I think the routines are important, especially around bedtime uh, when you get ready for uh, some refreshing sleep, you should be able to leave your devices and your, your work in another room and maybe read a book. And that's what I do every day before bed. And it seems to help me. And of course, I think, um, and this is very important during having gone through the pandemic is connecting with people and to do that in any way you, you really can, whether it be virtually, by the telephone, uh, in person now, I think the more you do that, uh, the more you can, uh, that connection with people uh, reduces the stress and you can kind of commiserate with your fellow. Um, and I'd like to turn that over to the experts uh, on the panel, but I appreciate you, you welcoming me here today. Look forward to a, a, a fruitful future with um, IACC. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Taves. I think you made some very important points. I think apart from you being the bridge of um, between uh, India and US on SME sector, both ways. I think one of the very important points you mentioned that was you got to live in the present. Past and future, it's actually, that's what happens. Everyone dwells in past or the future. So incredible because this is what our religious text Gita talks about, be in the present and you'll be less stressed. The other point that you rightly mentioned that we need to evaluate the causes of stress. That way we can try and address them. Maybe walking and connecting with people. Yes, I mean, these are very, very important points. Uh, Mrs. Taves and I'm keeping it on the table. I'm sure the experts as we go along, will talk on them also. Thank you so much for spending the time and giving this talk. Uh, I would now request Mr. Taranjit Singh of JIS group to come in. Has Mr. Singh come in? Uh, Sagar, is Mr. Uh, Singh uh, in the in the virtual panel? Has he come no, in? No, sir. He's not come in. All right. Not yet. Okay, then uh, let me skip and invite Dr. Alok Roy to be the next speaker. Dr. Roy doesn't need much of an introduction, but nevertheless, I'll go through the formalities. He's a, a nuclear cardiologist, but more than that, He's a social entrepreneur. He developed the medical specialty hospital, which caters to all sections of the people. He has also devised methods by which the medical facilities can reach at a cheap rate to the underprivileged through telehealth, through uh, project, and through Swasti, uh, to, uh, Swasti Mitra. Now, Dr. Roy is a uh, kind of person who can really give us an insight into stress, apart from him being a, a top medical uh, person. He is dealing with people with all round. And I would request Dr. Roy to take the virtual floor and make his presentation. Again, my humble request, kindly hold it to the 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Namaskar. Thank you, Mr. Sandhu. Uh, first of all, it's extremely kind of you to invite me to be here and share some of the thoughts which I have. And uh, I would agree with the, both the previous speakers that uh, which uh, Mr. Call said and Mr. Prey said that uh, knowledge, Mr. Call said knowledge is very important to control stress. And uh, as uh, you also reiterated, Mr. Shantanu, that being in current, being in now, is very important part of 
handling your stress. Now, at the end of the day, stress is nothing but a thought wave. What is stress? Why are you stressed? It's just the thought wave you have in your mind. And what is the reason for a thought wave? The reason for a thought waves are, as you, Mr. Shantanu said correctly, for worry about the past and anxiety about the future. A child is not stressed at all. He's jumping up and down, then fall asleep. Where, and he jumps all the time. But as an adult, we go by car to the office, come back uh, by car, sit on a chair in air conditioned room, and we come back, we are tired because we are stressed whole day. So what is stress? Let's analyze the stress first before we proceed further, how to deal with it. At the end of the day, stress is nothing but a thought waves. The thoughts which you entertain agitate you. And they agitate you and you are stressed. If there's no agitation, you are never stressed. When you're sitting at home and you are getting given a food, and if a food you don't like, because you have a thought wave, which expected a better food or better things, you start getting agitated and you get annoyed. You are stressed over the food. People are stressed because it's a summer, not winter. People are stressed because there's no rain. People are stressed because there is more rain. So stress at the end of the day is nothing but your thought wave. Thought wave, where it comes from? Thought wave comes from, from your desires. What you expect, how you engage with the world. The more selfish you are, the more stressed you are. More unselfish you are, less stressed you are. The more you engage with the world, for yourself specifically, you'll be more stressed. So stress at the end of the day is nothing but your mental modification. So you need to start, there's no way the world can take your stress away. The world will never give you a different friend. World will never give you your ideal environment. World will never give you enough money. World will never give you a suitable wife. World will never give you a suitable husband. World will never give you the clothes which you desire. World will never give you the car which you want. If you learn to manage whatever you have, you are always relaxed. But what happens, we keep on postponing our happiness on future acquisitions. We never uh, adjust with our current acquisitions. Who's poor and who's rich? Rich is not the one who has a lot of money, a lot of assets. Rich is the one who is happy with whatever he has. The poor is the one who's unhappy with whatever he has. If you have a BMW, you want to buy the Maybach. If you have a Maybach, you want to buy S class or even bigger car, Rolls Royce. So you're always unhappy because you have postponed your happiness to the future acquisition. So you are stressed in the current. If you learn to be happy and content with whatever you have, you'll never be in stress. What is stress? Same environment, the best example is the same environment, same circumstances, two people are facing the same circumstances. One is restless and stressed, other is calm. Why is other calm and unstressed? Because other one has understood and as Mr. Call said, he has a knowledge that stress is all my creation. The world never gives me stress. World will continue to move as it is moving. The world will behave exactly in the same manner. 
because my expectation and desires are far more from the world than the world is giving me, I'm stressed. So the, the first and foremost, how do we address it? If we are less selfish, if we learn to give, then to take. When A meets B, he thinks, what can I get from B? He never thinks, what I can I give to B? The moment you change your attitude, that what can I give him, rather than what can I take from him, you learn to stress. If your boundary of a life is not your family, family is center point of your life, boundary is universe. You will not be stressed. But we want everything for myself and maximum for my family. I don't bother for anybody else. Otherwise, how do you think Indians broom their house and leave the rubbish out of the house? Because for me, I matter. My family matters. What happens in neighbors outside, it's a government will clean it, it's their job. What if we collect those rubbish and keep in a corner for people to take it away? The, the genesis of a stress is in you, in your mind. Just withdraw yourself from the mind. Just withdraw. Not very far, a little bit. And look at your thoughts. What thoughts are creating stress in you? Be witness of your own thoughts. Watch them playing around you and giving you stress. Why do I, the moment I see John, why do I get stressed? When I'm walking towards home, why I'm getting stressed? Or when I'm walking towards the office, why do I get stressed? Why do I need Sunday? How is Sunday different from Monday? Why do I have a guitar on Monday? Because in my mind, I'm anxious about what Monday brings to me and I'm anxious how it's going to affect me. If I tell myself, whatever happens on Monday, every day Monday comes, I'll go and face it. How bad can it be? Immediately your agitation goes away. Immediately you are unstressed. So I think I'm approaching my 10 minutes. I still have one minute. So I will make a, 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 a couple of statements. The stress is nothing but your mental processes. And mental processes, more selfish you are, the more difficult and your expectation from world will increase. If it will be less selfish, your expectation from world will be less. So you'll be less stressed. Instead of taking from the world, to learn to give back to the world, you'll be less stressed. And third thing and fourth thing is that, remember that the world is, a, you get oxygen free. You remember when you go to the hospital, you pay me in lakhs for the oxygen which I give you for a couple of days. You got oxygen free for all your life since you were born till you die. Did you pay for it? No. Are you grateful? Are you grateful for the food which you get on your table? You never made rice and dal. If somebody made it, toiled in the garden, you just paid a couple of rupees to get it. Are you grateful to him? Are you grateful that you are alive today morning? Are you grateful somebody spins clothes and gives it to you to buy by paying some couple of dollars? So if you learn to have a gratitude for the world and learn to be unselfish and learn to be witness of your thoughts and control it and expect less and give more, you'll never be stressed in your life ever. Thank you. Over to Mr. Mukherjee. Dr. Roy, I can't thank you enough for putting these words in this presentation. It, I felt you're, a, you're speaking from a spiritual guru. So thank you so much. I mean, the points that he mentioned was live in the present. Don't be, unsel don't be selfish. Be unselfish. Try and not postpone your happiness for future acquisitions. 
I think these are extremely important points. And honestly, I have learned a lot in these 10 minutes. Dr. Roy, thank you so much for, and I, I frankly, I mean, I was expecting it, but I did not expect in such a short, crisp manner, which really goes to the heart. Uh, uh, now, can I request Mr. Saurav Tirani to take the floor? I would like to introduce Mr. Tirani. Mr. Tirani has worn many hats in the corporate world, but uh, I think his practice of pranic healing that he has practiced since 2002 has truly been magnificent. He has touched the lives of more than beneficially 10,000 people in 10 years. He's also author of the best-selling book, Spot the Next Economic Bubble. I'm going to read that and maybe I'll short the market when I see the bubble coming, coming down. Uh, Dr. Th Mr. Tirani, kindly take the floor, virtual floor. And uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, 10 minutes would, I'm really grateful you can hold your presentation in 10 for 10 minutes. Thank you. So I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Yep. Okay. So everyone, good evening. Thank you for having me over. Um, so <clears throat> let's get going. So in terms of stress, um, first time I remember ever read about something about the, I heard the word stress was uh, 1984. There was this particular article in a Time magazine. It defines stress to be a modern epidemic. Now it's 84. Right. So if you really take a look at between 1984 and now, stress is again, when you really talk about it, every one of us uh, to a certain extent are exposed to it. Uh, we all know what the you know physical uh, as well as emotional issues with stress really tends to be. Now, another very interesting thing is that if you really take a look at stress management as an industry over the years, even stress management has grown as an industry. Okay, so you have things like spas, you have drinks, uh, you have massage therapies, you have yoga. All over the world, people are adapting you know tools, methods in order to deal or manage their own stress levels. Now. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I basically, in college, I studied economics. I went to B school. And again, business school tends to be very, very stressful. So at the end of my first year, that's when I came across something called pranic healing. And um, after I finished my education, that's my MBA, I was in the IT world uh, for about 16 years. So. Um, worked in a leading IT uh, company, traveled across the world. It was again, overall as a job was very, very, very stressful. Also during this period, I wrote a book, uh, which is a best-selling book. And around 2018, that's the time I started getting a little fed up of my corporate career, of my corporate role, my corporate job. So that's the time I basically decided that let me just do something closer to my heart. So in terms of pranic healing, that's when I decided, let me just start switching over and teach people about pranic healing. Now, interesting thing, how many of us have really heard about what pranic healing really is? So this is uh, my teacher, This he's also the founder. So pranic healing in a nutshell is a no drug, no touch energy healing modality. Uh, it is established in 87, it's now present in over 90 countries. And again, importantly, while there are lots of applications, you can heal the body, it's, you can, it helps you with your mental health and so on. Pranic healing as such is not an alternative medicine modality. It's actually what we call complementary medicine. Now from stress management, uh, what does this exactly mean? Now, if you really talk about stress, uh, again, the way um, it was described by another panelist is it's, you know, state of mind, thought waves. Now, again, in terms of stress, there is a certain level of stress which is needed. There's a certain level of stress which is optimal. Now, what tends to happen is when there's too much of stress, uh, it starts becoming counterproductive. Now, even in my corporate career, what used to happen more often than not, we used to be on a very, very high, uh, you know, strain burnout. And one of the things I started noticing is a lot of my colleagues who are my age, they were all developing health issues, be it, you know, heart cardiac trouble and diabetes and back pain and hypertension and all kinds of issues. One of the things, uh, even despite having a very, very uh, demanding corporate career, what kept me a little sane, uh, in a sense, was uh, my knowledge of pranic healing and the application of the so many techniques we have in order to manage stress. Now, 
pranic healing, the, I, the actual concept is when you really talk about prana, prana is basically a sort of a invisible bio energy, right? So it is what keeps the body healthier and alive. So you again talk about this concept in lots of traditions in India, we call this pranayam, which is actually talking about manipulation of this energy. You find this concept in Japan when they talk about Reiki, Aikido, in China, when you're really talking about Tai Chi, Qi Kung, and lots and lots of other traditions. Now, the concept behind pranic healing is a little bit like this. You've got two bodies. You've got what is called a visible physical body. And around this, you have what is called an energy body. Okay, so an energy body is an invisible body, which is made, of, made up of prana, now, the point is whether uh, when you really first time you came across this, did it sound, it did sound and sounded a little bit like snake oil, but one of the things is there is some degree of scientific evidence for the existence of a possible energy body. It is through this technology, which is called the Kirlian camera. This is what it's possible for you to even take photographs of this particular energy body. Now, the point is your energy body can either have energy, which is clean and positive, or it can have energy which is dirty or negative. Now, the good question is where does the dirty negative energy comes, come from? So in lots of cases, it's to do with whatever's going around you, whatever's affecting you, be it anger, stress, frustration, fear. Eventually, all of these thoughts, emotions, they cause your aura to become dirty. Now, over a period of time, what tends to happen is it does manifest as psychological disorders, emotional disorders, sometimes physical pain and even physical disease. Now, the idea is behind pranic healing, if you really talk about stress, it's ultimately energy. It's, it's in your energy body, in your aura. Now, the way we handle this normally, when you talk about your physical body, every day we take a shower to clean our physical bodies. What do you really do about the energy body? It also needs constant cleansing and maintenance. So with pranic healing, there are multiple tools, multiple methods to accomplish that. So one of the methods in pranic healing is basically a no drug, no touch energy healing modality. Uh, you don't do anything in pranic healing other than using your hands to heal. So the same way you can clean your physical body with soap and water. What do you do about the energy body? So in pranic healing, using your hands, it's possible for you to remove a lot of these um, you know, thoughts. Ultimately, stress is like energy. It's like grayish clouds, which fills up your aura. Okay, so with pranic healing, no drug, no touch, just remove a lot of this energy out. You tend to feel happy, calmer, peaceful. And that's again, very, very important to have productivity, focus, and uh, you know, perform effectively. Uh, that's one of the techniques. Another very important technique, which you have all over the world, where you really see the resurgence of it, is to do with meditation. Okay, now this is another key aspect to help you manage your stress levels. Whenever you meditate, what happens is a lot of energy floods your system, floods your body. When this actually happens, a lot of these negative thoughts, emotions in your body gets cleansed, gets moved out, right? So um, these are a couple of practices, couple of techniques which keep me sane for most of my corporate career. Now, um, what we thought today is what we'll do, we'll just do for two, three minutes, we'll just basically, I thought we'll do a short, give you a short takeaway is one of the techniques which can help you manage your stress levels. So what I would just request you to do is um, yourself right now, just try plotting what's the degree of stress that you are under right now. Zero being none and 10 being you're super stressed, right? So one of the techniques which we can talk about, it's got something to do with this. Uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of us have seen this kind of an image. This is the laughing Buddha. So if you take a look at him, one of the things you'll actually notice is a big stomach. So what does a big stomach actually mean? Uh, doesn't mean too much of binge eating, doesn't mean too much of beer. One of the secrets is if you really talk about breathing, and that's what you even have in Indian yogic, yogic traditions, such as pranayam, uh, there is an optimal way to breathe. There is a right way and there's a wrong way. So what they say is the optimal way to breathe is what they call abdominal breathing. So if you see a baby sleep or a dog sleeping, one of the things you'll actually notice is whenever they breathe, uh, it's the stomach which moves in and out, right? So if we are able to breathe properly, one of the things which actually does tend to happen is a lot of energy floods your system. It helps disintegrate or remove a lot of the stress energy. So what I just thought we'll do is maybe we'll just do a short two minute ex experiment, see whether you feel any difference, right? So um, is everyone ready? So I'll just guide you 
So very simple exercise. All I need you to do is just sit straight, sit comfortably, keep your spine straight. Oh, if you possible, connect the tongue to the roof of your mouth. Okay, so we'll just try practicing some deep abdominal breathing with what we call in pranic healing, what we term as pranic breathing. Okay, so what I want you to do is inhale slowly, gently. Hold your breath for a second. Exhale slowly and gently. Hold your breath for a second. Inhale, hold. Exhale, hold. Inhale, hold. Exhale, hold. Inhale, hold. Exhale, hold. Inhale, hold. Exhale, hold. Inhale, Hold, exhale, hold, inhale, hold, exhale, hold, inhale, hold, exhale, hold. You normalize your breathing. How do you feel? Better. That was just, we did this for one minute. You guys notice there's a difference. So just one of the techniques, this is one of the things at least in my life, multiple occasions where you're really stressed out, you've got deadlines beating down upon you, don't know what to do. Just close your eyes, spend a few minutes, breathe and you know, stress levels get better. Okay, so I hope this was interesting and I hope this was helpful. Okay, uh, thank you so much for having us. And you can, if you wish, you can learn a little bit, read a little bit about Pranic Killing, lots of information available on the internet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tirani. You really walked the talk and uh, gave, us a, gave us a demo on the Pranic Healing, which I'm sure is one of the way to combat distress and it's something that you know all of us need to understand. It's nothing extraordinary. I think it's it's a discipline we need to take care and combat the stress. Thank you so much, Mr. Tirani. Can I now invite Ms. Jayashree Goswami to take the virtual floor? But a little present a little introduction before that. A past president of South Asian Bar Association of Toronto, Canada. Ms. Goswami, a senior litigator, a litigator practicing in the same city. Recipient of several prestigious awards, she has been a writer and a speaker on law and other subjects. Today, she addresses, I'm told, all the way from Edinburgh. Is that right? <laughs> Glasgow, actually. <laughs> you're, 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 where are you? Uh, in Glasgow. I took the oh, train from Edinburgh okay. to Glasgow. Okay, I, 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 think, I think I was misinformed, so pardon me. But uh, and we are we are uh, waiting to hear your presentation because I know it's a stressful uh, job and you're a high flyer, so it's even a greater stress. So kindly make your presentation, but kindly also hold it to ten minutes. I know I keep growing like a broken record, but uh, it'll even out for future speakers. Kindly take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mukherjee. After an introduction like that, I feel very stressed because I have to now live up to it. <laughs> but it's an absolute honor to be here today as I grew up in Kolkata. I will preface my remarks by saying how humbled I am by the wisdom I have gathered from previous speakers about the need for um, introspection, unselfishness, balance, spirituality. But today I will approach the topic of stress from a slightly different perspective. I'm going to address the need to understand stress as it currently affects and afflicts people with the intention of helping to create a safe space to discuss stress and stress-related problems openly, supportively. Now, you heard I am a lawyer practicing in Toronto, Canada. 
And by virtue of this, I bear the unflattering distinction of belonging to one of the world's top three most stressed and mentally unhealthy group of professionals, doctors and police officers being the other two. A recent survey conducted by the International Bar Association shows that lawyers across the globe score dangerously low on the well-being index of the World Health Organization, where a score of 52 or lower on the index signifies the need for mental illness screening Lawyers on average scored 51. But you rightly ask how any of this might be relevant to you. Well, what makes this relevant to you and everyone everywhere is the pervasiveness and the omnipresence of stress. Current times has made stress come into sharper focus. Um, and as uh, Mr. Cole said, you know, there's got to be something good about this. Well, stress affects everybody equally. It doesn't discriminate. It occurs among people of all races, ages, genders, professions, socioeconomic circumstances. I don't need to ask any of you whether you've experienced stress or trauma. The answer is, is probably yes. And so it follows that the lessons and takeaways from uh, the studies about stress in the legal profession are applicable in your contexts too. Now in the small limited time we have together, I want to address a small but key component of this stress conundrum. Um, we need to challenge and change the way we talk about stress. And most particularly, we need to openly advocate for change. As a lawyer, I often say this, a closed mouth does not get fed. Advocacy is a powerful and necessary tool for change. And I want to share with you some of the wisdom that I have gathered over the years and in the hopes that uh, I will leave you with some ideas and takeaways to start talking and thinking about stress differently. Let's dive into it. First of all, the term stress as we use it today, let's understand, is code for so much more than stress as we biologically understand it. Now, stress is the human body's alarm system. It enables us to react appropriately to threats. But the evidence is overwhelming that excess stress leads to various mental and physical illnesses. Now, among my lawyer friends, um, you know, a simple question such as, hey, how are you, leads to answers such as, oh, I'm busy, I'm stressed, I'm swamped, tired, exhausted, need to sleep. This is very normal. But I ask you this, if you find yourself or someone around you describing herself as busy, stressed, swamped, or tired all the time, or most of the time, it is possible and perhaps probable that the person very likely is struggling in some way or the other, perhaps even from some mental or physical illness due to chronic stress. So the next time someone says to you, you know, my work or my, my boss or my spouse, my child is stressing me out, ask yourself, what if the person is really saying to you that, you know, my anxiety is out of control, uh, my addiction has doubled, or even I'm battling thoughts of suicide every now and then and due to stresses in my life. People don't speak like this, but we need to understand that people, including you and me, will often sweep a multitude of emotions and problems under a carpet that we benignly have named stress. My simple point is that we need to start looking at stress. Seriously, we need to stop minimizing stress. Now, in addition to minimizing the, the, the bad impacts, the mal impacts of stress, our society also has this inclination, on the other hand, to glamorize stress. Stress has become a symbol in today's society and nowhere more than in the legal profession. And I'll give you a, a small example from my life. Uh, I started my career in one of Canada's um, very prestigious law firms, the kind uh, with offices that resemble an art gallery with the names of prime ministers on their letterheads, etc. So it's all very fancy and all very, you know, full of a place full of very smart and accomplished and driven people, uh, smelling of success. Now, as part of the firm tour, which is given to impress new hires, as I was then, and this is what was advertised. 
free dinners from any restaurant of our choice, and taxi to its home no matter how far home was if we worked late. There was in fact even a bed to sleep in, in some forgotten corner of the firm, if we were working through the nights. I recall a star associate, a really, really smart um, woman, who was paid to go on a five-star vacation at a Caribbean resort because she had worked so hard that she was burning out and didn't realize it. But when she came back, she was made to jump right in where she had left off. All of this sounded really exciting. And really where alarm bells ought to have gone off in my head, I thought, oh, I've, I've made it, I've arrived. Isn't that how we think? I mean, stress is almost a badge of honor. I fast forward a few years, several gray hairs later, having survived chronic insomnia myself, I think very differently today, and I also sleep better. But the truth is that glamorizing and valorizing stress is not unique to the legal profession. Life has become a competition of who is busiest. And the more we seem to sacrifice life and health and family for one's job, especially, the more important we perceive ourselves as and we're perceived as. But this makes us so far out of step with the research which shows how crucial rest is. A Stanford study suggests, and there are many such studies, suggests that productivity per hour decreases drastically after a person works 50 hours a week. So if someone's working 70 hours a week, research shows that that person accomplishes no more than someone who works 55 hours a week. But we as a society, we lay so much emphasis on being busy as a marker of success and value that we've persuaded ourselves that resting is a barrier to success, makes us unworthy of success. And this needs to change. Finally, I want to talk about the need to change the stigma that's associated with stress. And I understand that other speakers will touch upon it, so I will keep my comments brief. But this is a very important part of the advocacy piece. Stress, which leads to um, you know, mental um, conditions and illnesses and frailties and even physical illnesses, it's not an inability to do work. It's not, it's not a weakness. It is a disability which needs treatment, which needs uh, support, which needs accommodation, much like say diabetes or jaundice. Uh, it's also often invisible. And sometimes the most successful people, the most driven people are the people who are suffering the most. Um, think Robin Williams, for instance. Now, putting my lawyer hat on, if you are an employer, you have a duty, ethical if not legal, to provide a psychologically safe space for your employees. It also makes good business sense to do so as a business model premised on unhappy burned out workers while profitable in the short term perhaps is unsustainable, much like cutting down the Amazon forest. So if you're in a position of leadership in your organization, I suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that it is your duty to speak up about stress and normalize conversations about stress and have a zero tolerance policy to perceive stress as lack of skill or ability, remove the stigma associated with stress, because by doing so, you are creating a safe space. You are empowering those around you. And if you're not in a position of leadership in your organization, you can still exert influence. Be supportive and empathetic to your own mental condition first. Do not put others down. Talk to your children, talk to your friends, talk to your co-workers. People's minds can be changed one at a time. And in that way, I commend IACC's leadership in hosting this conversation on this very, very um, important and relevant topic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's start talking about stress. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Jayashree Goswami. It's an incredible presentation you gave because it brought out one of the most significant thing in stress that we need to unbottle ourselves. We have to speak. We have to speak uh, getting stressed because the society tends to think a guy who's talking about stress is weak, is uh, not worthy. So everyone bottles and gets more stressed. I think this has been a singular 
extremely important point that you mentioned, and we need to carry it right through. I've learned a lot of things from your presentation. The other thing is don't glamorize stress. It's not worth glamorizing. There's nothing wrong with getting stressed and nothing wrong to glamorize it. I think you're stressful in your lawyer's profession, especially a very successful professional like you. It transcends to other professions also. I mean, everywhere the stress comes and the way to deal with this, I think it's very important that we need to advocate, we get into advocacy of stress. In fact, uh, I don't know, I mean, lawyer, I mean, I didn't know your profession is so high on stress. Maybe some people are going from this bar to another bar to relieve this <laughs> stressfulness. Uh, just thank kidding. You. But but uh, thank you so much for putting these uh, points on the table. And uh, we, I'm really grateful to you because you brought this out. Thank you. Uh, I would, a little bit of change, I would request um, Mr. Ram Gopal Chancherla to take the next floor. And he's a, he's a healthcare sales and marketing vertical for four decades with Sanofi. And now a successful teacher, practitioner of laughter yoga. And that's very important. Raj yoga and other stress management. Uh, Mr. Ram Gopal Chancharli, kindly take the floor. Again, 10 minutes is your time. Is he there? Mr. Chanchari, Ram Gopal Chanchari, you have, uh, take the floor, please. Yes. Yes, I'm here. Can you see me? Am I audible? Uh, you're, you're very much audible. Very but nice you've got a unique background also. Anyway, we'll go ahead. That's the Tatars. The children undergoing cancer treatment in the Tatars. Okay, okay. They okay. are housed in one of the homes in Dadar, and that's okay. where I had an opportunity to de stress them. Uh, Mr. Andhra, kindly go ahead. Uh, I am afraid 10 minutes would be a max time for you. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Uh, friends, uh, may I request you to have this in a more participative manner? May I request everybody to wave their left hand? And as you wave your left hand, you say that I am physically present. And I'll wave my right hand and say that I am mentally present. Great. And I'll wave my both hands and then say I am spiritually present. You can bend down, come closer to the okay, screen. Okay, thank you. Yes. And now we go on. We heard this on stress and stress management according to many, many thoughts, stress management is breath management. And breath management means it is self-management. And self-management, according to quite lots of people say, it's the DNA. And what is the DNA? It is like we need to develop a new awareness. And what is the new awareness is, like what our speakers have said, we cannot run away from stress. We cannot bottle it up. We got to make stress my friend at every stage. And what I mean by what I mean by make stress my friend is it's like I change the consciousness. Three or four points I would like to make it as let's make all of us pass through the fear. Let's make it to faith. All of us have a tendency to blame situations, people, and things, and taking on to responsibility. We also get into the irritation and then to patience. We have to get in the quality and where is it? It's all within us. Then anger to assertion and friends in the industry where the Chamber of Commerce deals with is to say competition to collaboration, yes? And this is the shift in the gear that will take us through. And in the Raj Yoga, they, teach us that kushi, kushi is energy and courage. And it says that where thought goes, the energy flows. And where energy flows, it grows. You can raise your hands and say it grows, you know, it grows. And how does you grow? You have to grow it yourself. Now in the Western world, what are they doing with the left hand? They're saying bye-bye, winter. And in the right hand, they say welcome spring. And the way to say, you know, like a sapling, 
they grow it grows the sapling doesn't come out one moment it takes its own time to come up and up and up yes so that's what we need to say that the wastage like people they're talking about unnecessary usage of all the natural resources we need to need to really really avoid friends stress you need to say is pressure one of the many definitions are pressure divided by resilience and the resilience can come from many many methods and the method that i am aware of is through raj yoga meditation for the mind and laughter yoga for the body and now let's touch a few points about our laughter yoga and it'd be wonderful if all of us could participate and the laughter yoga like any any organization is celebrated recently on the 13th of march the 27th anniversary and laughter yoga has a vision and the vision is world peace through laughter and if you have a vision you need to have a mission and the mission says laugh for no reason It means no jokes no comedy no religion no politics no language and then what is the objective unconditional laughter for 20 minutes every day if you want to get rid of and come back bounce back unbottled and then what actions will you do and the actions are clap you breathe you be child like you know all of us hear this statement saas bhi kabhi bahu thi hum bhi kabhi bachche the all of us but we tend to forget that and then laughter yoga exercises which constitute a little bit of singing and dancing so friends i lead you into the four of them it will be wonderful if all the 80 people if i remove me it will be 79 of you can join up and let's do the clapping and the clapping will be finger to finger palm to palm in the namaskar posture and what do we do how do we count what do we count let's go back to a b c d our alphabets in the alphabets we have got all stress management all the people i what you call indo american chamber all the letters are there let's start out a b c d e f g h i j k l m n o p q r s t u v w x y z and see that my palms are tingling and what did we do we triggered our own acupressure points and this resulted in happy hormones flowing from my brain all over my body and in hindi you say to manchak mehsoos kar raha hu now get to the breathing when we breathe we normally breathe now our friend taught us about the pranic breathing something super the aura it takes care of the aura but here we really get that we have got in our lungs upper lobe the middle lobe and the lower lobe so the upper lobe how do i breathe reverse palms please join me reverse palms take it behind your neck careful eh? anybody with spondylosis careful now take a deep breath through the nose and hold it for five and a count 1 2 3 4 5 The second time when I breathe out, I'm going to giggle. Okay, take a deep breath. One, two, three, four, and five, and swing it on and say, "Ah!" <laughs> and friends, illuminaries who are here, come to the namaskar posture. And then this is for my lower lobe. Friends, we have two lungs, but you have only one middle lobe. Why? the god has given us space in the left lobe in the left lung he has created the space for the heart so i just have one more lobe on my right lung press namaskar posture take a deep breath up 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 stretch stretch let your hands touch your ears take a deep breath down 1 2 3 4 and then five <laughs> i giggle around uh, mr rangopal can we can we uh, keep to the time please If you don't yes. mind, I have a minute. Yeah, just yes. about. Yes, and now for my lower lobe, what I do is I stretch my hands out, slightly close the fists, and take a deep breath. Bring it to the chair. One, 
two, three, four, and five. Yes, friends. And finally, being childlike, let's use this word to say appreciation. Let's say these words. Very good. Very good. Hey! And that's what children like. We also like somebody appreciates us. And one of the methods to appreciate is index finger, thumb, make a nice circle and say, ah, <laughs> tell your colleagues, tell your competitors, tell family members, tell yourself when you look up in the middle in the morning and say, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, for the opportunity given, reminding me in time. And like our friend said, lots of stuff is available on the net laughteryoga.org. You could always look up and gain more knowledge. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Mr. Ramagovil uh, Chancharla, thank you so much. It was a very, very informative presentation and you also walked the talk. Thank you so much. It gives us a, a perspective that we have never had before. Uh, my uh, next, I would like to invite Mr. John Reed to be the next speaker. Uh, Mr. Reed is, uh, is, is, a, is a very impressive uh, CV, but I'll just leave out and give a small presentation. He's a CEO of Waterfield Firms Incorporated New York and a CEO of Aqua Safra Incorporated in Florida. He's systems design and operations to produce healthy, environmentally grown fish, shrimp, vegetable. I mean, this is very, very important for in today's world. He's also an agricultural designs expert for the US Forest Service International Programs Office. Extensive experience in biofuel feedstock development, sales and marketing in the US, Indonesia, India, Bangladesh, including biodiesel feedstock sales in industrial bio, biofuel blend stocks. Mr. Reed, thank you for joining us and uh, kindly take the virtual floor with a, again a request of hold it within holding it within ten minutes. Yes, thank the floor you. is yours. I, I will start a timer here so I can keep track. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank, thank you very much. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an honor and a pleasure to talk with you all. Uh, I have not been back to India in some time, so I can virtually uh, be there with you at the moment. So I'll start off uh, to say that as a small comment that I I'm not I don't get stressed that much. I'm just a carrier. So uh, people around me, uh, as a, as a small as a small a joke, but I, I'm billed here as a as a scientific perspective. But for me, this is more of an ecological perspective. So I'll share some of what I've come to manage uh, personally, but also uh, professionally, being in primarily in the agricultural and the aquacultural world. Uh, <clears throat> I'm dependent on many factors that often I am out of my control. You know, weather, many many factors. So um, my core business is producing low cost organic food at scale. Um, but we also have a mission and our mission is reversing climate change and putting ocean overfishing out of business. And I'll get to a point about where missions are important later on. Uh, but just having this work, uh, it can be hugely, uh, just having those as commitments can be immensely stressful. Like, oh, we want to reverse climate change. It's like, that's, that's a giant, a gigantic uh, task, um, but I, I think I manage it well. <clears throat> so, um, you know, and in the context, uh, we've all been very familiar with stress around COVID and all the personal things. That's a pretty big topic, but for me, the bigger one is climate change. That really is something to be stressed about. You know, if we don't manage that, it, 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 the potential is really apocalyptic for us. So there are ways, uh, but I get that many people have this as, a, as an existential uh, fear almost, not even stress. Um, so for me, there are two basic principles, again, informed by my work in ecosystems. I distinguish there are three, and, and this is, I'm interesting, as I, as I listen to other people, I see similar themes repeated throughout. And I think what I'm gonna touch on is the same points, but from a different perspective. So for me, there are sort of three principles in ecology of, of cycle, balance, and, and nurturance. And uh, to, to work, to identify that there are cycles in our lives, cycles in the ecosystem, cycles in our professions, and these cycles need to be kept in balance. And to keep them in balance, they need to be nurtured. So you need to nurture your career, yourself, your friends, and, and not to dominate. 
And this is very important. You know, a good example in, in ecosystems is when you have a problem with pests in your greenhouses or your fields, domination would be to spray pesticides. Just dominate, kill it, wipe it out. Nurturing is working with uh, other insects that eat and prey on the insects that you want. So just a very one small example. So of cycle, balance, and nurturing. And then within that, I live with that there is no truth as an absolute sense. There, that reality can be very squishy and how you look at it can be very uh, powerful and trapping you in a, a narrative that you feel very stressful. Um, so I look to distinguish what do you say you want? What is it you really want in your life? Uh, to distinguish that, what is that? Define it. And then uh, observe, are the things that you're doing giving you the things that you say you want? Uh, and there's no truth about what you want. It, it's gonna be just what you want. There's no, uh, no good or bad there, it's what you want. But what is useful then is, are you doing what gets you there? Or are you doing things that aren't getting you there? And this look is, is a habit, a practice, and then it's the simple observation of do more of what gives you what you want and do less of what isn't giving it to you. So that's a very basic, simple concept. <clears throat> um, so then the other thing is, is that when nothing is working, to be patient and remind yourself, it does get better. Because <clears throat> sometimes, you know, you're just in the moment of it, the stress, all the things you're doing, clapping, laughing, meditating, all the things we do, it just, you're just still freaking out. <laughs> so, uh, just, just be patient and know that it does, it does get better over time. So I'm about the two areas of what to do and then how to do it. So I'm going through quickly with these points because many people have addressed them better than I have. But for personally, the first thing is, is to forgive yourself, forgive myself. You know, stress is a natural response to challenging times. Some people often feel guilty. Ah, I... It's, it's, it's normal, you know, uh, association with you. What is it? Sometimes I'll notice myself. I'm all stressed out and I think, what, what was that? And I just feel like, oh, a car almost cut me off. Or sometimes it's a thing I'm thinking about, you know, the balance sheet for the company. I, I identify what is that conversation you're having. And then you, if you can, put things in place to manage that issue. If it's the car that cuts you off, drive slower. You know, if it's something else, you can make plans uh, to to address one of the biggest things of it is if you distinguish it's something you can't do anything about to go, become at peace with that you know the, the biggest most obvious thing is that we're all going to die you know mm -hmm. as the famous economist once said in the long run we're all dead so we need to identify that, that there are certain things we can't and to be at peace with those and that can take away the stress of that but one of the biggest things that helps me is having something that I'm passionate about or a cause. Because when you can put yourself into the cause, you get yourself out of the conversation. You become more about what are you doing for others? And again, this was referenced earlier about giving, but how are you contributing? And if you can put yourself in a position of contributing and giving, then the, the effort doesn't seem so hard anymore. You know, if you go on a long run, some people it's, it's agony and painful. Other people, they run for fun and joy. Uh, so. It's about how you put in, in, into perspective the thing that you're pushing and, uh, and struggling with. So here, I'm just checking my clock, which has all of a sudden decided to go away. So, um, so the, the other normal things I do personally is uh, you know, I, I exercise, I, I, I practice yoga, I meditate every morning, I do breathing exercises. This is a bit ironic to me to be suggesting this here in the US to a, a group of people in India where this is your, your culture. And, and, and uh, but it, it's immensely valuable for me, I, I, at least 40 minutes every morning. Uh, the other things is getting enough sleep. Sleep is such an important thing. Uh, we all don't have, I have a sleep tracker on my watch. I look at it every morning, am I doing well or not well? So then the other thing, once you have the personal, then to look professionally, you know, putting certain things in place uh, that manage your professional life better. So certain things often about trading a little bit of efficiency for resiliency. A good example is like your supply chains. Uh, are things coming from far away? It's very efficient sometimes to buy things far away, but it's not very resilient. It's very stress inducing to know, will the bags be here in time for the packing, whatever it is. So how do we implement things in our personal lives, often giving up a little bit of 
efficiency for a bit more resiliency. And that has a reduction in stress because you know you don't have to worry about those things. Other more obvious things like um, <clears throat> implementing preventative maintenance. Did you check your generator? You know, having charts and checklists to manage these things, they all reduce the stress professionally. And then, so those are some of the things, I'm rushing through this, but <clears throat> some of the other things that are quite valuable, that's those little what to do. Then there's the how to do it. And the first is, I love the, the cartoons that were presented earlier. Make this fun. You know, we're here, have a sense of humor. You know, it's not just about achieving, we're, we're actually living, right? Someone said, don't wait uh, for some future event to, to decide to be happy. We can just choose now, this is what's fun. I'm having a good time talking to you all <laughs> about stress right now. Uh, so let's, let's make that to be present that we are, this is, we're here to enjoy ourselves or we're not here to do that. It's nicer to be here doing that. <laughs> Again, the part about being no truth, it's just what works for us. It's, it works to be enjoying yourself. Uh, so let me just switch to the big thing that I began the conversation with, uh, which is about climate change. Uh, this is a very big stressor. And I wanna say that the, the planet, we have a limit of 350 parts per million in the atmosphere that we can't go over. We're already at 417. We're over the limit. We're at a level, you know, we say we can't go have one and a half to two degrees temperature rise. We're on track for four or five degrees right now. There's already too much carbon in the air. We have to stop putting more in there, but we have to pull what's there out. And the single biggest thing that this will help people who don't necessarily understand climate change but worry about it is carbon sequestration. And the single biggest thing that can affect this is agriculture, photosynthesis. There's no magic technology. It all doesn't work. I'll just say boldly and maybe a bit arrogantly, none of the stuff you hear about, the fancy machine, the cool technology, it's not going to be big enough, fast enough. What can is converting all of our crops in, in many areas to grasses and stop turning over our topsoil and pull carbon from the air into the ground, into our soils. If we were to convert just 30% locally of our agricultural, um, of our agricultural production into grasses, each acre or hectare of grass can sequester two to four tons of carbon per year. If we stop turning over the soil and grow grasses, plant our crops in those grasses, use the grasses as feeds for animals, we will sequester enough carbon if we have 30% converted in 45 years to reverse climate change. Just knowing that probably can be a very big um, reduction. So I believe my time is, is, is near the end. Yeah. Uh, um, so I'll pause on that if there's more conversations we can we can get to the, the technical details but there am i uh this this 10 minutes seemed like it was about two minutes but in any case <laughs> thank you all very much thank you mr reed i think yeah. it was an incredible presentation you made in 10 minutes cycle mm -hmm. balance nurturing i mean that's that's fantastic also you mentioned you got to know what you want so many of us meander not knowing what we want and we get into all kinds of problems be patient when the things are not working out and be at peace with yourself, be forgive yourself and finally have fun. I mean, these are spectacular takeaways from your presentation, Mr. Mr. Reed. Thank you so much for articulating them. My next speaker, or rather our next speaker would be none other than Ms. Alokananda Roy. Ms. Roy is a doyen of art in the form of dance, be it Bharatanatyam, Odissi, classical ballet. Mrs. Roy, more than this, has provided invaluable social service for reforming and rehabilitating convicts through her organization, Touch World, in India and abroad. Her designing of dance therapy in this matter is worth mentioning, has been very successful. In fact, Indian Post Service honored her in 2019 by bringing out a personal postage stamp. She is also a honorary citizen of New York, or rather U.S. Uh, Ms. Roy, it's an honor to have you here. So Thank kindly you. make your presentation, but again, request you to hold it in 10 yes, minutes. 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, firstly, for inviting me today and you know i would have been very stressed 
because of the outstanding speakers who spoke before me. And I would have been stressed and thought that, oh my God, what am I going to say now? But you know something? I have always tried to be myself. I think we are all unique in our ways. Uh, and I've never wanted to be like anybody. So I'm stress-free. And my and my I think my most valuable instrument is dance because dance liberates you know it liberates you uh, your body mind and soul everything you feel free and i have been dancing all my life and what i keep saying is you know like so many speakers especially i could connect with uh, dr alok roy uh, it's about i tell people that i i am not i'm not wealthy but i'm rich it's what you do with your life, whether you're happy with your life is what is important. I've never been into competition, ever. We all have our dreams and we are all, I think we should all be able to follow our dreams without pushing somebody down. So I've never been competitive and that has kept me stress-free. And also, I think, I. Again, you know, I'm going back to Dr. Olo Croy because I, I think very, very much like him. Uh, what he said was about what you want in life. You know, you keep wanting more and more and more and more, and that gives you a lot of stress. Contentment and happiness are two different things. You know, if you may be happy, but you may not be content because you want more. There's nothing wrong in that but it mustn't make you stressful. At the same time, if you're content, you're happy. But happiness doesn't always come with contentment. Let's be happy with what we have. We are all unique and we all have something to give. Yes, again, I'm saying this, that unless you're able to give, if your art, I'm a and I don't like to call dance or any, any um, art form as a performing art. Why do you have to perform all the time? It's a creative art which can not only create new things, but your art will remain selfish unless you are able to share it, to share the joy of it with others. And you'll be surprised to know that I have found my ultimate freedom in prison because that is where I found real people without any mask on. You know, they are real people and they are what they are. And when I came in contact with them, you know, I did realize that no child is born a criminal, right? They are all flowers, fresh flowers. And somewhere down the line, something goes wrong. But when they want to come back to themselves, we all have to help them do that. And my dance has been my medium. And I think, you know, if you feel loved, you'll never be stressed. If you can give love, you know, you're making that other person stress-free. Just a little touch. You know, sometimes just a hug helps. When you're feeling low, if somebody comes and holds you, you feel good. And immediately you're stressful. That's why I named, I've named my um, organization Touch World, because I know how healing touch can be. And I know how healing, just unconditional love can be without expecting anything in return. And we have to stop being judgmental. The more we judge, the more we stress ourselves because we are always trying to find fault in others, which it, somewhere it, it comes back to you. And let us learn to forgive because we have made so many mistakes. And if others have forgiven us, we have been forgiven. Why can't we forgive others? And you know that will make the world a lot more stress-free a lot more happy and we can love and I mean live as one 
and let us all have the freedom to choose to be who we what we want to be and not be like somebody else so and so is like this i have to be like that no we are all unique so we have to learn to accept ourselves to be stress free i don't know if i'm exceeding my time i always do but i'll stop here and i will thank you once again for inviting me i have i never i, I always come unprepared so i was feeling a little nervous because everybody knew what they were going to say but i have come as i am a free bird thank you so much thank you ms alokan roy it was an incredible presentation you made and you know one sentence if you sticks to my mind you found freedom in prison it's yes. really it's it's quite a reverse i mean yes. the prisoners also, don't yes. have freedom but you found freedom when you taught them that's because you were doing benefit to them without any selfish cause i mean that's that's fantastic you know i come from the rotary world which says service above self so i think it's a, it's a fantastic concept the other point that you meant mentioned was be yourself don't be judgmental don't try to be someone else i mean i want to be like mukesh ambani or let's say elon musk but that would stress me out enormously so that's that's a fantastic point you mentioned i mean a lot of people don't realize this they can have idols and they start going into this kind of mess yes. ms roy thank you thank you for the presentation especially what you have done for the convicts throughout the world thank you so much thank you thank you so much uh i would like to now invite a next speaker nilesh vaidya mr mr vaidya has had a remarkable career mr vaidya are you there mr nilesh vaidya um sagar is mr nilesh vaidya there do that but have to get mr karni's yeah just just a minute i think i'm making a this change yeah mr arun karna he is the atnt uh, he's the atnt head in india sales and customer engagements throughout the country he has helped in reinforcing atnt brand through speaking on various public forums in india he is passionate about mentoring and coaching next generation he uses spare time to provide mentoring to startups he holds a position of regional council member in indo american chamber of commerce in 2017 mr arun karna i really can't wait to hear from you can you take the floor and perhaps hold your presentation for 10 minutes Well, absolutely, I'll do that. Um, thank you, Shantanu, and uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's been really an illuminating and fascinating experience uh, hearing the other speakers go before me, and I, I feel a little underprepared for the conversation, having heard them. But let me give it a go. So I, you know, as you heard, I come from a company that runs uh, critical global communications networks that have to run twenty-four bar seven. uh you know 365 days a year so we are no strangers to stress and the stress is no stranger to us but you know what uh, you know this covid uh, episode gave a new meaning and dimension to the word stress for our teams and you know the reasons are very obvious some of the other speakers have alluded to it uh, you know the usual safety walls uh, vanished almost overnight you know the ability to walk to a colleague's desk and you know someone used the word commiserate you know just talk your heart out you know all those avenues just vanished overnight you know uh, the the informal interactions you know the water cooler conversations the coffee dispenser meetings the the gatherings or huddles in the pantry rooms and the lunch rooms where you really could look what was on your mind and maybe find kindred souls who would say oh maybe we are going through the same experience so you would feel Oh, you know, this is just not me. You know, there are others who are going through the same feelings. So maybe I'm all right. So all those natural safety walls really vanished overnight. 
And uh, to top it all, our operational environment became very complex. So, you know, almost overnight, we had to switch to work from home environment. And not only that, being service providers, we had to sort of enable work from home environments uh, for our customers as well. So suddenly, you know, there was this huge operational stress, you know, making the pivot almost overnight. Um, and top, to top it all, the government declared our services as essential services. So we could not slip up at all. We had to make sure our networks ran cleanly all the time. So that kind of put an additional uh, sort of load of responsibility, if I may say so. We couldn't let the nation down, right? So, um, and of course, there was the existential threat being posed by the pandemic, you know, employees and their families getting affected, you know, unfortunately, some fatalities as well. So, you know, I, I, all that is very well documented. So I'll probably not uh, go deep into that. But let me discuss how did we choose to respond uh, to those stress vectors uh, as, as, a, as a company, as a team. So I would quickly divide the discussion into three parts. First is, what is the leadership pivot or the change in leadership style that we tried to make to make sure that we were better leaders in trying to manage the team stress? The other is, what was the employee outreach, employee engagement effort we initiated in a bit to sort of calm everyone down and make sure that the team was managing the stress uh, you know, in, in an appropriate manner. And the third is, how did we accelerate the workforce reskilling and upskilling? And I'll try and connect that to why that is important in stress management. So uh, on to the first bucket, you know, which was the leadership pivot. So we quickly realized that this was the time for a more empathetic leadership, you know, which 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 focuses on the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. You know, team members should feel that the leadership understands and share their feelings. And you know why? Because there is no greater balm than to have a feeling that you are understood. You know, that's there's no greater balm. Uh, we encouraged our leaders to think more conceptually, more broadly. Yeah. And the reason is, you know, all those previous methods of decision making, data based decision making, all that became irrelevant because the data itself got massively skewed. You know, history was no longer a good indicator to the future. Uh, we encourage our leaders to sort of, you know, be more resilient as they're in their own persona and really interact differently with the teams, you know, show more inclusivity, uh, be more socially flexible. But more importantly, what we stress upon was you had to be seen to be leading. You had to show leadership. So it was not just enough to lead. You had to be seen to be leading as well. You know, that there had to be an almost this coming up out, out of the leader in the open. And the other reason was there was no longer the ability to be there with your teams in person, you know, shaking hands or encouraging someone, patting someone at the back. You know, those opportunities just vanished overnight. And all they could see was your face on Zoom meetings. So you had to be coming across as a different kind of a leader and really projecting yourself strongly to make sure that you understood and that you were one with them. So that was one pivot that we tried to make. The other style of leadership that we tried to pivot to consciously was what I would call effective leadership. Effective with an A. So <laughs> you may let me elaborate that. So we all know what effective leadership looks like, right? We, we all know that. That's generally understood. But effective means relating to feelings and attitude. You know, one that makes purpose, engagement, and fairness at the workplace important to workplace success, just as efficiency and productivity is. And the reason is the modern workforce, especially in these times of stress, they want their managers to respect them, to respect their concerns and values. And you know, it is very true in these times, increasingly true, I would say. Because it is at the end of the day, it is human networks and organizational cultures that affect and shape each other. Now, I personally drew a lot from the Japanese philosophy of uh, wabi-sabi, okay? And <laughs> without getting too philosophical, the essence of that philosophy, uh, philosophy is that essentially life is transient in nature and it is full of imperfections. And that is how it is meant to be. That is how life is meant to be. But furthermore, it states that there is inherent beauty in imperfection, right? So that's the basic philosophy. Now, if we translate that to our day-to-day -day life and our working lives, what it says is instead of striving for perfection, 
we should strive for balance and excellence. And I think some of the other speakers before me have well alluded to that. Basically, what it means is good is good enough in most cases. And we should not let perfect be the enemy of good because that causes unnecessary stress. You know, if in a task 90% result is good, then we should probably stop when we reach 90% because striving for that additional 10%, you know, creates disproportionate stress with diminishing rates of return as you go from 90 to 100. So it's probably not worth it. And I think so, uh, maybe John said it and other speakers also said it, you know, be kinder to yourselves. You know, don't beat yourself over minor failures. It's not just worth it. There's another day which will come. You will survive. It is all right. So that's the bucket number one. Uh, quickly on to bucket number two, we realized, you know, that employee engagement and employee outreach was extremely important. You know, when you get the team focused on a singular purpose, and if that purpose is to help and look out for each other, and if that is done voluntarily, then it is amazing to see how people jettison their own anxieties and worries, and they plunge into being part of a larger purpose, part of a larger group. That is exactly what we did, and especially in the deadly second wave of COVID in India. Uh, we formed voluntary employee resource groups, and we gave them a clarion call for helping each other, you know, find hospital beds, get oxygen concentrators and oximeters to affected employees and their families, get them connected to doctors virtually, get medicines delivered at home. And that really galvanized the workforce and brought them together like a large but close-knit family. And you know, we are talking about more than 2,000 employees across the country in India. And of course, we back that up uh, with support from the organization, both monetary and non-monetary, you know, vaccination camps, medical insurance coverage, enhancement for the full family, telehealth consultation for employees and dependents, salary advances, uh, 24 bar seven access to employee assistance hotlines to get counseling from experts if you are in mental distress, uh, expert sessions on, you know, some of uh, what has happened today is how to keep calm in COVID, how to live in uncertain times. And uh, an important session on post COVID-19 care and recovery. And also importantly, financial planning and well-being, which is so important in these times. And what it has done is to set the baseline to how do we make the team feel cared for? And that in itself is a great comfort and stress reliever for the team. And it basically sets the tone for the future. Now, COVID will pass by, but I think it sets the tone for future. Very quickly to my last point, which is the acceleration of learning and development pivot and why that was necessary. Uh, you know, there was a massive up, uptick in uh, digital transformation initiatives both within our own organization and customers' environment due to COVID-19. And that led to a lot of anxiety within the workforce, whether their current skills were relevant, whether they would keep the job, how would they survive in the new normal? And so we sort of, again, sort of a self-help approach. We formed local employee resource groups, and we started this program called the Digital Transformation Champions Program, which was employee-led. So the experts in digital technologies put their hands up and said, we will teach our fellow team members all the digital skills which they can apply readily to their day-to-day -day jobs. So if you're in financing, if you're in accounting, if you're in HR, how do you take those digital technologies and readily apply to your day-to-day -day jobs to After make them more meaningful and rewarding and therefore allay the fear that you are not up to the digital age, so on and so forth. And lastly, I would say that we've been urging an employees to get their financial affairs in order. You know, write a will, get your near and dear ones nominated in your bank accounts, insurance policies, provident funds, and let them know how to access the funds in case of emergencies or you know, eventualities. Because I would say financial security in itself is a great stress reliever in these times of uncertainty. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll conclude uh, my thoughts and. Thank you for listening to me so patiently. Thank you so much. Mr. Arun Karna, it's been a pleasure listening to you. It's been a pleasure because I'm learning from you on the, how to manage stress in a corporate world. I mean, I've been a consultant and frankly, I'm going to take this away and consult on this basis. So you're giving me a free input. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, Thank you. The points, I think the leadership pivot, empathetic leadership, it doesn't come easy. But 
Obviously, you've worked on that. You've worked on employee outreach, where a very important point, focus together, where everyone helps everyone. Again, a very, very important point, something that you know I'd like to implement with the companies that I'm consulting. I got a free input, so thank you so much. And lastly, reskilling. It's been a fantastic thing. And the last thing you mentioned was the financial security. I, it couldn't have been a better word to de-stress in, in these difficult times. Mr. Arun Karna, thank you so much again for being so pertinent and so very articulate on these issues. My it's pleasure, been a wonderful. My pleasure, sir. Thank you. Uh, my next speaker, again, I'm sorry, it, our next speaker would be uh, Ms. Hina Gorsia. Hina Gorsia, a good friend of mine, has been a past president of IACC. In fact, she was a president prior to I became in the early part of last decade. An entrepreneur, fashion designer, and a successful business person. Recipient of Rajiv Gandhi Foundation Award, Bharat Nirman Award, and Award for Excellence in Education. Ms. Gosia is widely traveled and is often invited by various governments. Hina Gosia, kindly take the floor and enlighten us with your wisdom, but hold it for 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shantanu. And it's great being on the same forum with you again. I'd like to start with saying hello to Kapil, my fellow members, guests, and friends from all over. Before going further, I will do this and I need all of you to follow suit. Smile, yes. That's it. And now we don't have stress. So what do you want me to speak about? But let me touch upon it. And uh, there's just one thing I'd like to fill in the gap, uh, which Shantanu, of course, he was briefed uh, to make brief my CV. And that is about education. I have had tremendous experience of almost 25 years in education, not teaching, but managing education, various types of education at various levels. The reason I mentioned this is because ISCC requested me to speak about stress particularly in the education center. So now you'll know where I'm coming from. Education sector lately has been the worst affected. We have all experienced stress before COVID, during COVID, and now in its later years. Our experiences have been different. But what about the younger ones? We talk about corporate, we talk about us breathing, we talk about dancing, everything. But let us focus on the younger ones. Our next generation? No, generations. What did they go through? Their classes were hampered, exams were postponed, admissions process was delayed or in total disarray. The most experienced teachers did not know how to move forward. They have never taught online. And that too, just for a limited number of students, because here in India, most of them did not have access to internet. The family owned one laptop, which daddy took to work. Education was hampered 
indescribable. So what happened? They forgot what school is about. And then when we had hybrid education, some of them could study online. Again, I emphasize that some of them could. And also they could only study certain syllabi. So it was tragic. Above that, many of the children faced tragedies in the house because of COVID. Family members were very ill, they were hospitalized. Some of them even lost their parents. We have a lot to deal with. Can you imagine the stress these children went through or are going through? This is the real meaning of stress. By the way, in a lighter note, if you spell stress backwards, it says desserts. So we are going to turn this stress around to desserts for these children. Even for the college going children, for us, they are children. And it is our duty that we care for them. Like someone mentioned, I think John spoke about climate. We are responsible for climate change. We are responsible for our next generations, which include education. If given a list of one to 10, I would put education as number one. I'm not health, not hygiene, not poverty, nothing. Because I believe that education is a solution to the rest of the list. Now, where is the word stress that I'm supposed to speak about? Here I had to dramatize what stress is for these children. And now let's get together and get that dessert for them. We have a responsibility, yes. I'd also like to say one or two things to the parents and maybe the teachers too. Do you know how much you stress the children even without these natural calamities or man-made calamities, you stress them by giving them targets because you have targets at home and you say, I need an A plus, I need a hundred on hundred. This is stress. Like you've been advised by the previous speakers, to be kind to yourselves, please be kind to the children also. Parents also go through a lot of financial stress, but the biggest stress is when the children see the parents going through separation. I can't advise you on that, but I can make you aware of it. Today, education is a fractured education. We all think we are doing good for them. We are all doing the best for them. And I'm sure we all will to do the best. But before that, we need to find out what is the best. So how do you handle this? stress for the children. A bit of advice for these teenagers or youngsters who have joined us in this webinar. I understand they are from the college. 
quick word of advice, because very soon I'm going to hear Shantanu tell me, you have one minute. So in that <laughs> one minute, quick word of advice is, parents and the children, or just the children, make a roadmap for yourself. These are uncertain times, so you need to make a new roadmap with a plan B. You need to make a roadmap for yourself. Many of you are far from home. Many of you are far from school. You had to come back. So you need to make a new roadmap. You don't need to stress that oh, I was going to be a doctor, and now what do I do? It's okay. So many to be doctors returned from Ukraine. They all find a new road map from, for, your, uh, for themselves. So you make yourself a new road map. And believe me, you, this will be a better one. Don't worry. And then you also need to think about finance. If you've already spent some money on your previous road map, you need to work it out now for the new road map. If you've returned from the US or UK or any country abroad back to India because of COVID or because of any other reasons, Find yourself a new education. You will not be less educated or you will not be a lesser person. So many of our kids have studied in India and they are the top 10 outside today. The biggest CEOs of the 10 top corporations. So you will be a success in India. Find a new destination and a new roadmap and you will be a survivor. More than that, you need to be mentally strong. Yes, go and watch the Avengers. They've got Captain America, they've got Superman, they've got so many more. You can be one of them. That's it. Be strong. And you know, like Alokananda said, unconditional love. Oh boy, where are you going to get that? At this age, be ready for a breakup. That unconditional love takes time to come. So you know what, you know what I do? I settle for unconditional love with a chocolate. It's easier to get, it's tastier, and if you get a dark chocolate, it's healthier. So don't let anything break you up. You be my Superman. And I'm going to wait to see you fly. Nothing will break you. Be there. Be there. And if your parents, oh, I don't want the parents to listen to this. But if your parents keep nagging you, do this, do that. This is the way to study. Hamare zamane mein ye hota tha. You have your plugs, don't you? And all you need to say is, chill out, pa. That's it. Good luck to all of you. No COVID and no stress and no nothing is going to stop any of us, we are all going to be chilled. And yes, I also do another thing, which I don't advise you to, but the day I'm 
very, very stressed and the chocolate doesn't work, just have a shot of vodka. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Hina Gorsia, as usually, you're mesmerizing. I've always thought this is going to be a very important, and but you've clearly exceeded my my uh, desire or my benchmark. You've bought a very important part in this uh, presentation, students. The, the educationists you, the top education that you are, you have mentioned their problems and you have also given solutions. Parents must listen to this. They must understand that they cannot transform their desire on the children. They're all unique. And for the children, new roadmap. That's really motivational. Fabulous, uh, Hina Gorsia, for bringing this up. I'm sure the audience is lapping it up. And uh, can I give you a chocolate when I meet you next time? Thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. May I request now our next speaker, Anushila Brahmachari, to take the floor. Ms. Brahmachari is a sports psychologist and counselor of Medica Super Specialty Hospital. Ms. Brahmachari, please take the virtual floor and your time as usually is not more than 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I would like to share my screen, so I'll take 30 seconds to do that. Uh, I need a confirmation. Can you see my screen? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is my screen visible? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, firstly, I would really uh, thank you all for making me a part of this forum. I heard all the fantastic speakers speak from a very multidisciplinary approach. And I would, I'm anxious if I can contribute meaningfully to this conversation, but I'll try my best. I'll resort to, uh, resort to my uh, experiences that I have gathered through my work. I'm a mental health practitioner. And as a result, I got, got the opportunity of working with several patients who were dealing with stress during the last two years during the pandemic. The pandemic has induced a lot of stress within us due to several reasons. I would focus on one of the lesser discussed topics or the source of stress, that is finances. So like it has already been told, uh, uh, in the title itself, that the defining characteristics of 2020-2021 was uncertainty. There was uncertainty around our health, our free movement, our lifestyle, and of course, it eventually trickled down to finances as well. But when it trickles down to finances, it directly affects our sense of security. We feel that the only thing that can hold us together is at stake right now. And hence, if you see that in many discussions, when we, when mental health professionals, we talk about um, stress management, we talk about health, we talk about lifestyle, we talk about the stressors that life poses to us, but finances are a lesser discussed uh, topic. Because when we talk about finances, it's a very specific thing, money. And if you don't have money, too bad, might as well try to acquire some money. But not having finances is a source of intense anxiety and stress. Some of the patients have even shown post-traumatic stress symptoms due to financial crisis. It has to be dealt with, but I am no financial expert. So I will not get into the nitty gritties of how finances should be managed. Rather, I'll focus on the psychological correlates. When we are managing finances, when we are talking about reorganizing finances, there are certain psychological barriers that come into play. I would focus on that. If there is a stress, the first thing that is required is to express. This is true for all sorts of stress that when we feel stressed, many of us feel that we have to control ourselves. It, it shouldn't show, it shouldn't come out, there shouldn't be enough expression. The fact that I'm feeling vulnerable shouldn't show. It is very important to do quite the contrary, the otherwise, that is to allow yourself to feel upset, to feel angry. If there is a stress, if there's a problem, if you are behaving normally, if you're behaving like 
Nothing has happened that is rather not so normal. It is okay for you to feel upset and angry, but then that often trickles down to the concept of self-pity, where you get spiraled around the concept that why such a thing happened to me? It starts with a denial. It starts with this feeling that I am a victim. When you feel victimized, then your sense of vulnerability and helplessness grows. And that forbids us to reassess the situation and to reboot. So it's important to express, avoid self-pity, and then focus on reassessing. Well, when we are reassessing a situation, there are two correlates of the situation. One are controllable, and the other one is uncontrollable. Uh, any situation can be divided into these two sets of elements, and the uh, names are self-explanatory itself. Things that you can control are controllable. Things that you cannot control are uncontrollable. The uncontrollables, when we focus on the situations uh, uncontrollables, we tend to get trapped into something called rumination. Yeah. Rumination is a mental trap where you feel like you're doing a lot, but you're not reaching anywhere. I'll give you two very common examples of rumination. One being, you are constantly thinking, what are the things that can go wrong? You fail to understand that things that you are thinking will go wrong, will it actually go wrong or not? You constantly catastrophize in your mind. The other example of rumination that I have heard a lot during uh, the pandemic period, when the market took a hit, many of my clients mentioned that we are constantly checking our oxygen through that uh, oximeter uh, instrument. And the other thing that we are doing is people who have invested a lot on their stock markets, they were constantly telling me we are checking our stock every hour, every two hours, even though we know that nothing is going to change within this short span of time. Such behavior exhausts you, but it doesn't lead you anywhere. Health, hence the sense of helplessness increases. There are a few tips to avoid rumination. First thing is to notice, to identify that you're ruminating. Once you do so, it is important for you to distract. And by distraction, it is not a great concept. It is very simple. You have to remove yourself physically from the act of rumination, preferably from the place where you are sitting, and to engage into something light, interesting, and something that will break the chain of ruminating thoughts. It can be music, it can be a phone call, it can be a stroll, something to break that line of thought. And then we have to reboot the thought in a more structured manner, which will lead us to solutions. And when we talk about solutions, we come to the controllables through the problem solving approach. It is a rather linear approach focusing on here I am and here I would like to get. So it is very objective, very constructive, and this empowers us, particularly in terms of finances, problem solving uh, approach is essentially helpful. There are certain things that facilitate the problem solving uh, approach, one being problem analysis. When we are posed with a problem, we would see that we are always focusing on the negatives of the situation because it's a problem situation. So what are the things that are going bad or that can potentially go bad? Simultaneously, there are always a set of things that can potentially be a support in overcoming the situation, which are our resources. We often fail to see the resources. For an analytical approach towards problem, we have to identify the resources using which we are going to overcome the negatives of the situation. And the next is to avoid rushed decisions. Uh, under stress, our emotions are at a heightened situation and we fail to reason with things. Especially when it is finances, we feel so distressed, we tend to act upon it so quickly uh, and take decisions which may later make us regret. So it is important for us to avoid rushed decisions because they are often led by emotions and they are not well thought out. So the crux, the crux is planning. We have to plan. Planning always reduces vulnerability, especially when we are talking about crisis. 
And if we are talking about planning finances, yes, financial planning is required, which in a layman's way, it starts with budgeting. And budgeting starts with listing out the expenses. But uh, I would ask all of you, uh, you may relate to this. This has happened to me many times. I, I am sure many of you will find it familiar. Budgeting, although such a simple concept, how many times have you failed in budgeting or how many times have you failed in sticking to your budget? Like I said, I'm no financial expert. I will not get there, but budgeting has a lot of psychological uh, barriers and I'll quickly go through those. It's an all or none approach. All or none approach means uh, either when we start budgeting, when we list down our expenses, we try to write it down all. It is important for us to focus on the important things than on every detail of it. We have to be flexible. The next month syndrome. Say for example, right now, if we decide that from tomorrow, we are gonna start budgeting, many of us will feel, no, no, this is the middle of the month, we'll go to the next month. And that is where our intentions get diluted. It is best to start immediately. And the third is judgment. When we list down our expenses, we get a visual representation right on our faces. And that's when we start judging ourselves internally about the things that we have done. And these are the potential barriers which stops us or inhibits us from the budgeting process. Many of us may even feel I have done it all. I have tried my best and yet I am feeling stressed and anxious. What should I do? Well, the last but the most important message that I have today is to reach out for help. And here it is very, very important for us to understand feeling stressed, feeling anxious doesn't make you weak. It only makes you human. We all feel stressed and anxious. And sometimes it's difficult for us to reach out for help because we feel that makes us a, a victim, that makes us someone who is failing. Researchers have shown that women are better off in talking about their stress and they are better off in reaching out for help. Uh, that is a note for, from me to all the male members present here that especially when we are talking about finance, it, it is also added with a sense of shame. It is important that we transcend all these mental barriers and take help so that we can evade many major mental health crises that can also lead to fatal outcomes. Thank you so much. I think I have stuck to my time and that's all for me today. Thanks. Anshula Brahmachari, I I, it's been a wonderful um, listening to you. You know, I am personally a chartered accountant and a financial advisor, and I've seen exactly what you have said. This rumination, the word I didn't know, but it is exactly what happens. The people tend to kind of go into a kaku world and don't, don't get into real world because there's a belief that everything will get solved. Also, the budget. You won't believe what I've, and you've hit the nail on that. I don't know why you don't call yourself a financial expert. You are. Uh, people don't like to create budget for themselves. There's an often an ego problem, from the, especially from the male guys. I know everything. Why do you have to create a budget? Right. And when the budget is done, the fact hits them on the face and they can tend to recoil. But you have put all these points on the table and I'm sure all the audience here, all of us, and personally me, is going to benefit out of your presentation. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Anshula you. Brahmachari. It's been wonderful listening to you. Can I now invite Dr. Francisca Patino to come on the virtual floor? Is she there? Uh, oh, yes, yeah. I'm here. Oh, okay. Uh, just a little introduction to you for you. Uh, pediatric registrar in the UK. She graduated from the University of Liverpool in 2014 with MBCHB with honors. She's a member of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. Her personal interest is neontology. Now, it's so pertinent that you're here and thank you so much for joining us. We are all eager to listen to you, kindly make your presentation, but I would really be grateful if you stick to the 10 minutes uh, time yeah, that's frame. Fine. That's no problem. So uh, my name is Frankie. I am um, a um, trainee within the UK. Just bear me two seconds. I'm just trying to share my... 
presentation. Just on some technical issues here. Okay, it won't seem to let me log on. It seems to let me share my presentation. Bear with me two seconds, I'll be back. I'll rejoin and see if it lets me. Dr. Petito, are you coming in? Dr. Francisca Patino, are you coming in? She's connecting. She's connecting. Okay, great. Sagar? It won't let me share my yes. screen at the moment. Is Shudipta already ready? In? Hi, it's Francesca here. I can't see you. Hi, can you hear me there? Yeah. It won't let me share my screen, so I can talk about my slides, but it, for some reason sure, it won't sure. let me share. My sure, sure. Um, so I'm a paediatric registrar in the UK, and um, I've been asked to give a medical perspective about the stress and management um, around the pandemic. And obviously it's different here to it is elsewhere around the country. Um, one of the first things for me that's poignant is there was a report in the UK about um, the, called the Pearson Report. And one of the, the quotes that came for that was that it must be, we must improve the way in which we um, look after ourselves and our colleagues so that we can be better, better placed to look after the needs of our patients. The, the pandemic has had a massive effect upon the world, upon everyone worldwide. Um, and some of the effects that we felt here in the UK there's been an, unimag an unimaginable pressure on a healthcare system that's already under strain. Um, we've had a varying degree, depending on the specialties that you work at. I've said that I have an interest in neonatology, but currently I'm a general paediatric trainee um, working across the hospitals, but also working in a community setting as well. The impact of that, not only upon us delivering care for patients with COVID-19, but also delivering that um, you know, the impact upon the workforce and workforce planning, particularly with sickness. Um, we've also had people not within paediatrics, within paediatrics redeployed um, during the height of the pandemic. And that obviously put to stress upon the internal stress within the system. Um, we've been ever responding to changing needs throughout the global health challenge within the UK. And even more so now, as we're emerging into a more post-pandemic world, um, the, the changes upon the service are ever evolving. Um, we've still needed to care for patients throughout. Um, and in doing that, we've had to be involved in changing some of the processes, particularly related within paediatrics. A lot of our care for our children, um, we've had to provide more um, training to parents to allow them to provide care at home. So in particular, some of our oncology children who may have central lines, we've provided parents with training for them to care for the lines at home. Pre-pandemic, they'd come into hospital. During the pandemic, they cared for these at home. 
now we're emotion, rem- approaching a more post-pandemic world, actually it's probably going to be a more of a hybrid approach for these parents. We've also done this for our children who have Hanox Shenline purpura. Again, these children should have regular monitoring. It wasn't deemed safe for those children to come into hospital during the pandemic. So we very quickly had to fashion programmes and um, things that parents could do from home. One of the strongest points I think that's come from the pandemic um, and has helped with stress management, but also makes it exceptionally difficult is the use of technology. I know this has made it very easy for MDTs to continue to happen, for virtual clinics. Um, We've done some telephone clinics and there's been setting up of electronic prescribing um, services in particular in the community setting as well, allowing patients easier access to their medications. However, the use of med- use of technology within medicine, um, I do feel has um, broached the difficulty um, that often comes with striking a home life work balance. And it's made everybody very approachable, but almost at times too approachable. And that work life balance and that balance of, you know, being able to have a defined workspace has become quite muddied in the water. We've also set up additional services. So during my role as the um, registrar, I was involved in setting up a a brand new respiratory unit for children during the height of the pandemic. And that's got an impact upon trainees, but also upon existing consultants about staffing this. Um, That, you know, it's going to change the numbers. It's changing the numbers of people required and the impact of that upon the larger effects. So stress because people are overworked when they're in work, that people aren't... um, able to get their annual leave, the people aren't able to continue to do the things that they need to do for personal professional development. So I feel like the, the, the pandemic has hit across a number of um, points really. Why? What is the impact of all these um, increasing demand upon services? Well, actually more stress upon services results in more stress upon staff. And there was an article in the BMJ um, in 2021 that highlighted exactly that. Um, the well-being of the staff is paramount, ultimately pushing people beyond their limits, pushes people to pass fatigue and decreases performance. It's got a massive impact upon patient safety. And anybody who's a doctor will tell you that one of the one of their main say is being a doctor's duty as a doctor is to ensure that their care for their patients is safe. Pushing people beyond these limits actually damage it, it majorly impacts patient safety. Also has a massive impact upon staff morale and also staff retention. Um, You know, we want a workforce to be happy, but actually a workforce that's overloaded and struggling and fatigued isn't going to feel that way. Stress also has a very important impact upon sleep. Decreased sleep affects your immunity. During going through a global pandemic, um, everyone was desperately trying to avoid getting COVID-19, actually becoming exhausted, becoming fatigued and having a decreased sleep leads to decreased immune system and has a negative impact, massive negative impact upon people's mental health. So we're returning to a more normal life now. Um, COVID-19 still continues despite us returning to a more normal life. And in the UK, you know, restrictions have been lifted further, but actually COVID continues to have an impact upon staffing. You've had a workforce that have been exceptionally um, worked quite hard and tirelessly over the last two years. And actually we're still continuing to feel the impact of COVID um, on people sh- um, needing to isolate from home. That continues to impact rotors. That continues to ask people to do things that they're otherwise not expected to do. It's a tired workforce covering gaps. This is a big thing that we need to think of moving forward as more of contingency planning. Returning to more normal services, there's definitely some bonuses from having some of our care virtually. And I think that we'll see this moving forward. Um, It's likely probably gonna be a hybrid approach. And I think within medicine, this is certainly something that um, the COVID pandemic certainly catalysted us more towards a virtual um, sort of hybrid approach um, of both face-to-face clinics and virtually. Um, You do lose a lot of that in terms of clinically when you're seeing patients sometimes, the bonus of seeing them face to face can be lost from a virtual clinic. So these need to be done with caution. Um, the vaccination children within programmes. So this is something that's only fairly recently happened within the UK. And I know people elsewhere in the US um, 
and elsewhere in the in the world have been doing this um, for a much longer period than, than us. But actually, there's some uncertainty with parents um, and the children, particularly the children with complex needs, have been shielded for quite a number of time. Um, so it's about approaching that uncertainty with the parents and trying to find some um, understanding as a, as a physician. There's also uncertainty with people with regards to further situations in the future and also future resilience. Um, currently, unless there's a lag in period of time of another um, event like COVID-19, which I'm sure everyone will not wish for, um, currently the workforce is feeling very tired and um, it's had a major impact. So what can be done? Um, one of the things that we've seen here is a massive role of peer support. We've used technology to, to help us do that. Um, particularly within the UK, I work within the Merseyside region, so that includes Liverpool. Um, we've used um, networks such as a platform such as Zoom, MS Teams, to discuss with regional MDTs, and in particular around the cases of the um, paediatric inflammatory and um, multi-system response, or the PIMS TS, that we're seeing as a result of COVID-19 in children. They're not becoming acutely unwell with COVID, but they are, some of them are presenting a number of weeks down the line um, with a multi-cystic, a muscly system inflammatory response. Also, it's always the awareness of gratitude, you know, appreciating colleagues um, and appreciation goes a long way. Um, and it's about being mindful of that. Um, some system, systems are put into place rather than an incident reporting system, sort of a, a report in excellence. And I think this is certainly something that's that's valued for us here. Um, connecting with colleagues, and it's important to identify with colleagues that you work with, those who do need additional support, the role of counselling, the role of CBT, um, the role of sort of peer support, even in that setting, for those who are struggling, I think is, is really important. And then about self-care, um, when there's a global pandemic and everyone's being forced upon, um, it's very easy for other things to come in a way, but actually, um, as my last slide here shows, um, you can't pour from an empty cup and you have to take care of yourself first. And so from my perspective, um, you know, there are certainly a lot of challenges within the medical field. And I have no doubt this will continue to go as we, as we progress from a pre-pandemic to a pandemic to a post-pandemic world, the situation is very much changing. I think the pandemic has shown us that we are able to do this in a fairly timely manner, um, but it's about being, being mindful that this doesn't happen with a negative impact upon the people that are um, propping up the workforce. Thank you very much. Shantanu? Shantanu, you are muted. Yeah, sorry. Dr. Patino, uh, it's, been, it's been a wonderful presentation from your end, especially from a medical perspective. You mentioned look after yourself and look after other patients. You also mentioned the peer support. I think it's a very, very important point. The peer support and coming togetherness is something that all the speakers have spoken about, especially Hina, and I can't emphasize more on this, and I'm sure this is going to ring a bell for entire audience. Technology support has really improved. So we thank you, uh, Dr. Patino, for your presentation. Now I've got a problem. Problem is that uh, Mr. Shudipto Das, who is supposedly to conduct uh, concluding session session is not around. So can I request Mr. Kelby Brooks to take over and I make a presentation of yours and then maybe we can get into a small Q&A. Mr. Kelby Brooks. Uh, so I should start my presentation now? Yep. Okay. Uh, I think it, uh, something has been said a lot in this and has been very important is managing stress from the personal perspective and looking at things uh, from the perspective of what is causing the stress in your life and examining that and working to change that. I would like to take that a step further and look at the concept of information and the internet and how much 
of that can contribute to our stress. Now, the internet and the information it provides is incredibly valuable. We have been able to access vast amounts of knowledge that were frankly not available at any other time in human history. But at the same time, we need to understand that not all of that is just there to be helpful. A lot of that is there with an agenda. A lot of that is there with a goal in mind. Uh, if something is providing you a service for free, uh, then it is not in fact a free service. You are the product. And oftentimes the product they're seeking to obtain is your attention because your attention is quite valuable. Now, given that, a lot of internet websites are focusing very heavily on what they can do to keep your attention as long as possible. And one thing they found, whether intentionally or unintentionally through an algorithm, just reacting to what keeps people on the site, they have discovered that making people stressed and angry and upset are very effective ways to keep people coming back to their news sources which seems somewhat counterintuitive. You would think that if something was upsetting you and stressing you, you wouldn't continue to come back to it. But what we see is that that is not the case. Uh, people will continue to engage in something that makes them stressed and anxious. So from the perspective of the personal and minimizing that stress, I think it is very important that when we are engaging with information online, we should recognize what it is trying to do. Is it trying to inform you without bias, or is it in trying to create an emotional reaction that keeps you coming back? And within that environment, we should just be very aware of what these things are doing to us and the pandemic of stress, because there's a pandemic of COVID, but there is this pandemic of stress. And it is, some of it is from personal issues, which that's, many people have talked about that and talked about how to try and manage that. But there is also this issue of the external factor of external factors attempting to create stress for their own benefit. So how do you deal with this? Well, in the same way, one must be cognizant of their own thoughts. One must be cognizant of the thoughts of others and what they're attempting to induce and ask. When I go onto this website, when I go onto the social media, when I go onto this news channel, ask what are the effects that they are realistically creating with what they're saying and what they're doing? Ask yourself, is this useful to me or is this just creating stress? And more importantly, are you falling into this loop of coming back to things that create stress just to get you to stay there? So I guess that is the long and short of my presentation. It's not as long as others or as detailed as others, but that's, I think, a very important thing. When you're consuming media or digital content, be very aware of what it is doing, whether intentionally or unintentionally, to keep you on their site, whether that be freak you out, upset you, or stress you. And monitor that as much as you would monitor your own thoughts for creating stress. Uh, thank you. That's what I have to say. <laughs> Mr. Brooks, you have brought a singularly important point. In fact, this is a point where all of us have fallen in a trap during the COVID time. You know, there's a WhatsApp university that goes on with a huge amount of uh, information flow, which enables the negativity to grow in you. Google also brings out a lot of issues. So you keep visiting Google the algorithm picks up and picks up more. I think it's a very important point and, uh, and we really need to be, and you said you need to be realistic, assess whether the same is uh, creating more panic or is it realistic? I think Mr. Brooks, you made a very, I think the entire audience is grateful to you for making this point. Thank you so much. Now, uh, I have the pleasure of giving the vote of thanks and um, while giving the vote of thanks, let me first thank IACC for bringing this topic on the table and enabling the entire audience, including me, to understand the 360 degree variety of the stress and its solutions. It's been wonderful. I, I do not want to thank, I, I mean, I, I cannot thank individually all the panelists, but they've really enriched this discussion. And all I get, the chats which show that they're deeply uh, enriched by the thoughts, by their solutions, by the processes, 
by the dangers of stress in these uncertain times. And I really can't thank enough to all of you. I would like to especially thank President Call for um, pushing this issue in the webinar. Uh, Mrs. Madhusri Daitri for helping us, Sagar in the background. And of course, we, we cannot do, uh, no, no pro program can take place without the sponsors. And we have got medical specialty. Uh, so, uh, sorry, we got uh, Medica specialty as sponsor. Thank you so much. And I would again like to thank all the panelists for sparing the time and giving us such a wonderful presentation. Uh, Kapil, would you like to say something or uh, should we close the seminar now? Okay, I think, I think it's not there anymore. Uh, thank you so much. And I would like to conclude this uh, program with uh, three cheers for ISCC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Quite... And also, also, uh, let me thank you for not increasing my stress by keeping time. I mean, that's been a marvelous thing. I mean, every one of you have kept to the time and, you know, it's I, I didn't get stressed out. And, you know, this nothing could have been better than this. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, you too, Shantanu. Mr. Mukherjee, uh, we would like to thank JIS for their kind support. Yeah, of course, uh, JIS uh, for the support. Yes, definitely. Yes, sure. Taranjit Singh, very kind of him, you know. Yeah, Mr. Taranjit Singh. I wish he was here, but Mr. Taranjit Singh has been such a uh, stalwart supporter of ICC, and uh, we really can't thank him enough. Mr. Mukherjee, thank you very much from the from Indo American Chamber of Commerce for your wonderful, wonderful moderation. I'm thank not too sure. I'm sure I've annoyed people here, but that, that no, probably goes with the job. One was you had a very wonderful panel. They all uh, stuck to the time. And thank you, and really, I thank the panelists. For not only in their wisdom, for the discipline and the and the crisp way they brought out the solutions. Beautiful. This cannot be had from any other place. Yes. I'm sure everyone here has enriched from this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye right, everybody. Thank you.